Nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. This quote can be found at the beginning of many biology textbooks, ones that you'll encounter from middle school all the way up through graduate school. Indeed, it was found in a, a number of textbooks that I myself personally owned. This quote by the great Ukrainian-American geneticist and evolutionary biologist Theodosius Dobchansky at first glance may seem to be just a simple statement about how important evolutionary theory is to the world of biology. But the more you come to understand about life and about evolutionary theory, the more you understand what a profound statement this actually happens to be. The fact that when you look at life in close detail, nothing about it really makes sense unless evolution is real, unless the core tenets of evolutionary theory are actually true. The other thing I've encountered as a biology professor are a number of people that challenge the key tenets of, bio, of evolutionary theory. But one of the things that I've found is that many people have issues with evolutionary theory that aren't issues they should have at all because they're not things that pertain to evolutionary theory. What I'm trying to say is one of the best ways that I've found to teach evolutionary theory is to start by talking about what evolution isn't. So if you have a complaint about evolutionary theory or something that you don't understand about evolution, well, a lot of times the, the complaints that I hear or the things that people disagree with aren't things that pertain to evolutionary theory at all. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what evolution isn't. And I know that seems like a strange starting point for a conversation about Darwinian evolution, but I think it's the best one that we can do. So stay tuned while we talk in this video about what evolution isn't all about. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be talking about the things that evolution isn't. We're going to be talking about the things that either evolution has never attempted to explain or misinterpretations of evolutionary theory that people often use as a basis for disputing or disagreeing with evolutionary theory. One of the things we'll start with is the, uh, the origination of life on Earth. A lot of people point to evolution and say, I don't believe evolution explains the origins of life on Earth. Good, because it doesn't. When we're talking about the scientific explanations for the origins of life on Earth, those broadly fall mainly under the umbrella of a theory known as abiogenesis, which is the appearance of living things from non-living matter. Now, there are lots of different hypotheses that fall under the abiogenesis umbrella. These are things like the primordial soup theory proposed by Alexander O'Perrin and J.B.S. Haldane. You've got your clay crystals theory proposed by Karn Smith. You've got your deep sea vent theory or your deep hot biosphere that have been proposed by Thomas Gold, for example. And you've got autocatalysis that was proposed by Richard Dawkins. These are all scientific explanations for how life may have first originated on the planet through entirely materialistic means. And they all fall under the broad scientific umbrella of abiogenesis. There's even a theory that life actually came to Earth originally from outer space. This is known as panspermia. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that we're talking about like gray aliens coming down and starting Earth as a Petri dish or anything like that. What we're talking about is the fact that perhaps self-replicating microbes may have appeared on the planet through some type of interaction with an asteroid or a meteor. To be fair, these scientists are typically in the minority. But the bottom line is that if you have a disagreement about the materialistic origination of life on Earth through, uh, through non-celestial means, your gripe is either with uh, is either with one of the abiogenesis theories or with panspermia. It's not with the theory of evolution. And the theory of evolution has never attempted to say that it could explain the origins of life on Earth. Rather, the theory of evolution describes the processes by which life changed and diversified once it existed on this planet. Another common misconception about evolutionary theory comes down to the simple fact that evolution would tell you that individuals do not evolve. Now, it's been quite fashionable for people to talk, particularly politicians, like to describe how they've evolved on the issues. Now, that might be nice that we change our thoughts to come to understand things better and make better decisions about public policy. However, from a scientific perspective, individuals do not evolve. Individuals develop. We begin as a single cell, uh, and then eventually 
we begin to develop over time first through the processes of gestation from zygote into fetus then we are born we go from being an infant to a toddler to a child to an adolescent to a full-grown adult we develop from a single cell into many trillions of cells and this is the same for all living organisms they start simple and they can develop into more complex organisms but this process of developing over time is just that it's called development it's not evolution from a biological standpoint you are as evolved as you are going to be evolution is a population based concept so here's a great way to distinguish between development and evolution the beak of a finch will grow over time during the process of development until it reaches adulthood and at that point the, the size of that finch's beak will no longer grow. It will no longer change. It's fixed. That is development. But if you measure the average adult beak length of a population of finches and you continue to measure it over time, you may notice that the average size of the beak may shrink or increase depending on changes in environmental conditions. This, the change of the average beak length over time, would describe an evolutionary process. Populations evolve, individuals develop. Another common misconception about evolutionary theory is that somehow people think that evolution is a goal-directed process. It's not. Evolution is not a ladder. Life is a branching tree. The way evolution works, quite simply, is through the appearance of random mutations within populations. As we'll learn, all populations have variation, and variation comes from random mutations that appear. And some of those mutations are beneficial, and some of them are harmful, and some of them have no effect at all. But because evolution is based on the random mutations that occur, there really can't be any sort of goal directed to it. The other thing to understand is that species don't evolve because of some vital force or on purpose. It just happens. So as a result, a bird can't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to try to evolve wings so that future generations of birds will be able to fly. It doesn't work that way. And one of the things that we have to learn to do is we have to learn when we talk about evolution is we need to make sure that we're not talking from teleological arguments. We don't want to say things like birds evolved flight because that's not how it works. The more accurate representation of the scientific data is that over time, birds gradually evolved wings, allowing them to fly. Now, is there a separate conversation about the myriad benefits to being able to fly, the evolutionary advantages that would cause certain species to evolve wings and to fly? Absolutely. And those are valid conversations. But to be clear, we want to steer away from arguments. We don't want to, as much as possible, talk in evolutionary context of things purposely trying to evolve because they do not they simply cannot evolve we can't sit down as a species and try to do things to evolve our species through materialistic means it doesn't happen that way that being said we also have to consider the fact that there is no peak to evolution we as humans do not represent the pinnacle of evolution at all in fact when we look at life as a whole, we may see organisms that appear to be more simple than others and other ones that are more complex. For example, multicellular life is more complex than unicellular life. But that does not mean that we are more evolved than, for example, our amoeboid cousins. That's not true at all. There is no peak or pinnacle to evolution. Yes, species tend to be ideally suited for their environment in many cases, but as we'll learn in just a few minutes, a lot of times that ideal fit is only skin deep. Many people also assume that evolution yields the production of perfect organisms. In fact, some people take umbrage with it, saying that they don't think that materialistic processes such as natural selection could lead to the evolution of perfect organisms and that there must be some type of intervention leading to it. Well, I've got bad news for people that are using that argument. Organisms are not perfect. In fact, evolution does not lead to perfect design. It simply can't. And the thing that you have to realize is evolution is not the master of perfection. Evolution is the master of good enough. And the main reason for this is evolution doesn't get to create things from scratch. Instead, evolution has to work with what's there. It works by molding and shaping existing structures or existing genes and, using, and, and working with those to create things that are simply good enough to improve a species. 
if you want to look at, at great examples of of how life is not perfect there are myriad examples now i know what you're thinking oftentimes we look at animals in their environment and they look ideally suited we look at polar bears and go wow they have white fur because they're adapted to their environment but one of the things you have to realize is when you start going beneath that superficial appearance of perfection a lot of living things are a complete mess so here are just a few examples one of the best ways to look at imperfection in living things is to look at them anatomically. Let's look at a panda, for example. A panda is, in fact, a bear, and most bears are omnivores. They go around eating both meat and they go around eating uh, fruits and, and, and vegetables and things like that. On the other hand, pandas are strict herbivores, but they have the entire digestive tract of an organism that is supposed to eat some meat in its diet. And as a result, their diet isn't particularly nutritious. Uh, to them because they can't digest the majority of it that requires them to spend the majority of their time eating the other thing about that is because they eat predominantly bamboo they need to grasp these branches in order to ingest them well they also don't have an opposable thumb we are actually much better adapted for at least grasping those bamboo shoots and consuming them than the pandas are you would think that if a species was ideally created to ingest bamboo shoots they would have at least been given a thumb but they're not and the reason why is because pandas have had to evolve from their bear ancestors that don't have opposable thumbs and they can't just suddenly make one. You are no exception to this. You, as well as all tetrapods, have a nerve called the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Your left recurrent laryngeal nerve actually runs from your brain and it needs to innervate this area of your throat that controls like your larynx and your voice box. Now you would think the most direct route for doing this would be to go from your brain down to your larynx, but it doesn't. It actually goes down into your chest, around your aorta, and then back up. So theoretically speaking, if you take a strike to your chest, it could actually paralyze your vocal cords and also make it difficult to breathe. Another thing that that left recurrent laryngeal nerve is responsible for. Now, unless you think this is simply an example of poor design in humans, it also exists in all tetrapods. And when I talk about tetrapods, I mean all things that have four limbs, and that includes giraffes. Think for a second how long of a journey that nerve has to take to go down that big goofy giraffe neck, around the aorta, and then back up that big goofy giraffe neck to get to the point where it needs to end and innervate its particular tissue. It is measured in feet to accomplish this. This is not an ideal design, but the thing is this. That particular nerve evolved when tetrapods were still fish about 400, 500 million years ago living in the ocean. And if you're a fish, you don't have a neck. Therefore, it's not a big deal if that nerve has to go around the aorta to get where it needs to go. But as tetrapods evolved necks, that nerve had to compensate. You can't break the aorta and you can't break an essential nerve to sort of replant it. So evolution was stuck, making this nerve ever longer and longer as the neck length increased. In humans, there's another terrific example. There is actually a gap between the fallopian tube and the ovary. So the egg is produced in the ovary, but it needs to make it into the fallopian tube in order for proper fertilization to occur. You would think that such an important aspect of biology, such as reproduction, a necessary function of all living things, if you don't believe me, go see my video on the seven key characteristics of life, you would see that reproduction is one of those key characteristics. You would think that it would be absolutely secure. But occasionally, the egg doesn't make it across the gap from the uterus into the fallopian tube. It misses. And fertilization actually occurs outside of the uterus. It actually occurs in implants inside of the abdomen. This abdominal pregnancy would be absolutely fatal to both the, both the growing fetus and the mother if it wasn't terminated. This type of error is another terrific example of poor design. But again, this is the result of our evolutionary history as a species this particular these particular structures evolved again before our evolution as tetrapods 400 or 500 million years ago in our aquatic fish ancestors so in your body you have somewhere between 20,000 and 25,000 genes that encode for proteins but you also have several thousand genes that are just broken they're called pseudogenes they exist but they don't actually encode for anything and you're not alone almost every species examined has some collection of pseudogenes broken genes. Now we know what these genes are supposed to do. Because of molecular biology and genetics, we can actually go back and examine similar genes in other species that aren't broken. 
and we know what the functions of those genes used to be in our ancestors. But the question remains, why do we have thousands of broken genes? Here's a good example of one. In all primates, there is a gene called psi, G-U-L-O. The little Greek symbol psi indicates that it's a pseudogene. Now, G-U-L-O is found in almost all mammals. G-U-L-O is a gene that encodes a protein that produces vitamin C. However, in all primates, this gene, G-U-L-O, is broken. It's mutated in such a way that the protein cannot be produced. It doesn't function, which is why vitamin C is an essential vitamin in your diet. You must acquire it through your dietary intake. Now, you may be wondering, why is this even why does this exist and why don't we have a pseudogene? Well, we actually know the answer to this. We know what mutations exist and we know why it's broken. But one of the things we also know is in primates, it was allowed to be broken over evolutionary time because we acquired so much vitamin C from our diet. Then a group of stupid primates decided to leave areas of the world where vitamin C was predominantly available in their diet and moved to other places where it wasn't. And as a result, that psi G-U-L-O has caught up with us. You may remember that if you don't acquire enough vitamin C in your diet, you're subjected to a grotesque disease known as scurvy. And this is why you need to acquire. You actually have the gene in your body, G-U-L-O, to produce vitamin C. It's just mutated and broken. If there was some way to unmutate that gene and turn it back on, you would never have to drink orange juice again. The hundreds or thousands of pseudogenes that are found in, in most multicellular species aren't the only example of things that are found broken or not functioning in the way you would expect them to function. There are structures known as vestigial structures. Perhaps the best known vestigial structure in humans is actually the human appendix. The human appendix is this little offshoot of our intestine. Now we know that many other mammal species have appendices. And what these appendices are typically done, uh, typically used for is to help break down roughage, help break down uh, like woody foods or things that are difficult to digest. It's an offshoot of your intestine that aids in that. But because that's not part of our human diet and hasn't been for hundreds of thousands of years, over time, our appendix has actually shrunk. It's what's known as the vermiform appendix uh, or worm-like appendix. And it's now this tiny little organ. And in a significant portion of the human population, this particular structure will actually become clogged and get infected. And if it explodes, could be potentially fatal to the people who have uh, this particular affliction. Now, why would this actually exist in humans? Well, the answer is kind of simple. It's evolved over time. It's, it's, it's devolved over time because it's no longer useful to us. So why have it in the first place? It's a terrific example of a vestigial structure. But not all vestigial structures need to be useless. Some vestigial structures have lost all of their use altogether. One might argue, actually, and some immunologists have found that the appendix is actually an important component of your microbiota. It can actually house species of bacteria that are good and aid in your digestion. This is an example of exaptation, a change in the function of a structure. But that doesn't render it a non-vestigial structure. It's still not doing the thing that it evolved to do in the first place. Another great example of a vestigial structure are the wings of an ostrich or any large ratite or flightless bird. Ostriches, emus, and rheas. These are large birds that never use their wings to fly. Now, why would they actually have wings in the first place? Well, it's simple. Ostriches and rheas and emus are birds and all birds have wings. Some of them are just less useful than others. So the question becomes, why have them in the first place? Well, it's just a result of their ancestry as birds. If you were to make a more functional ostrich, it would be probably better off having useful appendages other than wings, like give them at least some baby T-Rex arms. But that's not going to happen because evolution doesn't get to begin with new material. It has to work with what it has. Now, are the wings of an ostrich completely useless? Absolutely not. Ostriches run incredibly fast, and they're actually able to use their wings to help them steer and make very tight turns, which allows them to evade their, evade their predators. And they're actually very fierce animals. Never, ever try to attack an ostrich. It won't go well for you. But that doesn't mean that its wings are not vestigial structures. Wings evolve for the purpose of flight. Since ostriches no longer fly, those wings are now considered vestigial structures. Another great example of vestigial structures are the pelvises of whales and snakes. Think about what a pelvis does. In tetrapods, a pelvis is a bone that helps you connect the legs to the rest of the body. You have a pelvis. So do cows and cats and dogs and pretty much anything else with four legs. 
Why would a whale or a snake have a pelvis? They don't have legs. Well, guess what? Hundreds of millions of years ago, or tens of millions of years ago in the case of whales, their ancestors did. But if you look at the pelvises now, they don't make any sense in their skeletal structure. There's nothing connected to them. In the whales, they just kind of float around apropos of nothing in the middle of the whale's body. So why would a whale have a pelvis? It's just simply a vestigial remnant of their ancient history of being a four-legged creature. And in fact, we have a very, very well-stereotyped series of transition fossils of the 50 to 60 million year evolution of whales from four-legged semi-aquatic mammals into fully aquatic mammals that we see today. And you can see the evolution of that pelvis and how it slowly shrinked relative to its body size as it became less and less important to the function of the organism. Living things are far from perfect. And oftentimes when we see organisms that are ideally suited for their environment, there are certain parts of their behavior or certain characteristics of their structure or their appearance that make them look ideally suited. Things like camouflage or a chameleon's tongue uh, or, or, or a zebra's stripes that make them appear ideally suited. But oftentimes that ideal appearance is just that. It's an appearance and it is just skin deep. And when you begin to look at the anatomical or the genetic makeup of that organism, you begin to see that organisms are not perfect. In fact, many of them are hot messes, including human beings. The next thing I hear about evolutionary theory that really bothers me when people say that evolution is just a theory. When you hear people say that evolution is just a theory, they're imparting undue certainty under, onto a scientific principle. One of the things I would ask you to recall from one of my previous videos about the scientific process is that things in science get elevated to a theory. And the problem is, is people often misrepresent the scientific term theory to mean what we use in everyday parlance as a hypothesis. So we tend to view in everyday terms of theory as sort of a potential guess at what might actually be an explanation for an event. That's not the way it works in science. In science, a theory is something that has been rigorously tested again and again and again. In fact, in science, a theory is a lot more akin to a fact. Let me give you some examples of other things that are just scientific theories. Atomic theory, the theory that everything is made up of atoms. Gravitational theory, the theory that gravity actually exists. Heliocentric theory, the theory that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. Quantum theory, an explanation for how, how minute particles behave in the physical universe. And the key thing to understand about all of these is nobody seriously doubts any of them. Nobody seriously doubts that gravity exists. But here's the thing. You can doubt gravity. You can say that you don't believe in gravity, and you can climb up to the tallest building or fly in the highest flying airplane. And when you jump out, you can scream at the top of your lungs that, I don't believe in gravity. And here's what happens. You still fall to the earth. And the reason why is gravity is a fact. The other thing we have to understand is that Darwinian evolution, or the modern evolutionary theory that we talk about, has been rigorously tested for 160 years. And to date, there's been nothing that seriously challenges it. There is more evidence for evolutionary theory than many other very common theories that people regularly accept. And just like those theories, evolution is a fact. It's not just a theory. Another thing that I hear from various sources is that the theory of evolution is in trouble or there's some serious doubts about the theory of evolution now. That's just simply not true. Now, are there ongoing debates within the field of evolutionary biology? Absolutely. People commonly discuss whether or not clade selection is real, or they want to know how much sympatric speciation has played a role in the evolution of animals. They want to know how much of a role does genetic drift actually have to play in the evolution of species. But these are debates, to be clear, that we don't have the answer to at this point. We, don't, we haven't resolved these debates. But this is not the sign of a field in trouble. In fact, this is the sign of a scientific field that is being heavily investigated. And the other thing we have to understand is the core tenets of Darwinistic evolution, what we now refer to as neo-Darwinism, our modern understanding of evolutionary theory, have never been changed. They've never been seriously challenged. The core tenets of evolutionary theory have remained unchanged for almost 160 years, which tells us that evolutionary theory is perhaps one of the most rigorously tested and time-tested scientific theories 
in the history of science, in the history of the world. And time and time again, scientific uh, data has supported evolutionary theory. So if somebody tells you that scientific that, that the scientific theory of evolution is somehow in trouble or now being seriously doubted, they're just incorrect or they're making up information. The core tenets of neo-Darwinism have really, really never changed and they've never been significantly challenged in a way that would cause anybody to seriously doubt them. And no scientist uh, seriously doubts whether evolution is real. The other thing I often hear is that I just don't believe that life could have evolved through sheerly random events. In fact, there have been some very, very intelligent scientists who have challenged evolutionary theory on the basis that they don't believe that complex life could have evolved through an entirely random process. And you know what? They're right. But here's the thing. Evolution has never claimed to be a random process. There is, to be sure, a random component of evolutionary theory. That's mutations. And remember how we talked about mutations are the reason why evolution can never be goal-directed. There is no purpose to evolution because mutations occur at random. They occur during cell division. They occur as a result of exposure to chemicals or the sun. But they never appear on purpose and they never appear in a coordinated fashion. That is the random component of evolution. But evolution itself is not random because these people forget about the other part the mechanism by which evolution occurs, natural selection. All of these random mutations are filtered through natural selection and only those mutations which benefit a species begin to accumulate. Perhaps one of the best definitions for evolution I've ever heard comes from Richard Dawkins, who refers to evolution as the non-random selection of random variants. That is indeed what evolution is. All of these random mutations are forced through the filter of natural selection, where mutations that are harmful are weeded out, and mutations that are beneficial to a species become retained over time, because those individuals who carry those beneficial mutations are able to survive and reproduce in higher numbers, thereby passing on their beneficial mutations to subsequent generations. And over time, because these individuals are reproducing in higher numbers, they, that beneficial mutation begins to accumulate. That particular type of inheritance is what leads to adaptation. So to be fair, those individuals are correct. But to be fair to the evolutionary biologists, those individuals who claim that life could never have evolved through evolution because it's random, just don't understand evolutionary theory in general. They forgot about the other big part, the part that causes the selection. So today we talked about what evolution isn't. We talked about some of the more common misconceptions or misunderstandings about evolution and evolutionary theory. It's now time to turn our attention to what evolution is, to start talking about what evolutionary theory discusses, how it works, and the key tenets of evolution. We'll talk about that in my next video. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you'll tune into my future videos. I really appreciate it. I hope you learned a lot, and I'll talk to you real soon. Bye!